Forward head posture is the mother of all neck pains and headaches and sometimes it can even result in very very serious conditions such as thoracic outlet syndrome. In TOS, thoracic outlet syndrome, you have compressions, nervous and cardiovascular compressions that happen here in the scalene triangle which will impair, completely impair the blood circulation in the arms. I have treated people who had arm pain i.e. being not even able to turn the pages of the book for months due to thoracic outlet syndrome. So in this video, I want to share with you the detailed protocol that I use with my patients to deal with this condition. Of course, it's a standard protocol and whenever you deal with individual patients, well, you will adapt the protocol to their living conditions, to their habits, to their medical status. But that will give you a strong basis for, say, treating your issues related to forward head posture. This is a protocol that I use over a six month period. This means that you should not believe the videos of the people who tell you, I'm going to give you three magic exercises to deal with forward head posture. That doesn't exist. As you will see, forward head posture is intimately related to your daily activities and to your habits. And habits are not changed overnight thanks to three exercises. That's a blatant lie. Number two, forward head posture is complex because it's a vicious cycle. I have a video on the channel which is dedicated to explaining the mechanism behind forward head posture. The link is in the description. To cut a long story short, bear in mind that forward head posture is the consequence of a vicious cycle. This vicious cycle has three components. One, your mid-back is round. Two, your shoulders are forward. Three, your head is forward. And each one of these three will cause the two others. So whatever you do which creates one will automatically generate the two others. For example, if you stand with your pelvis forward, you see that your mid-back is round, therefore your shoulders are forward and your head is forward, etc, etc. Hence, we need to deal with all these aspects that are connected to your daily activities and we need to fix the muscle length, tonus and relaxation in the areas. After each session, we want to define one exercise and one goal. The goal is related to your daily activities and it's something that should keep you busy all day long. The exercise is the subject matter of dedicated exercising sessions, morning, evening, afternoon or more, but it's something that doesn't have so, so much to do with your daily activities. So you see, one is correcting your habits, the other one is more a symptomatic approach. Step one of the protocol is related to patient empowerment. It's related to explaining to people what they suffer from and why we're going to treat forward head posture. The reason why we need to do that is that forward head posture is in all your daily activities and if you see people say one hour every two weeks well how do you want to be able to follow them for the rest of the two weeks they have to do it by themselves to do so they need to have understood how the body works and this is called the three rules of posture again there's a video which i also link in the description but let me summarize it Rule number one speaks about the shape of your spine. It states that when your back is slouched, that means round and compressed, you increase the chance of a disc hernia, you push the head and the shoulders forward, which is what we're trying to fix, and you shrink the lungs. 1B, that's not a reason to get a hollow back, yeah? Excessive hollow curvature will strain the lower back muscles or the spinal muscles in the areas which are hollow, can be your neck, will increase the pressure on the intervertebral cartilage. And in the lower back, hollow back plus uh, effort, physical effort, such as CrossFit, for example, will create incontinence. One C now speaks about twisted back, i.e. the family of scoliosis can be twisted from below, twisted from the middle, twisted from above, or twisted 
because of a rotation. This is a bit like a hollow back, except that it leads to asymmetric strain. So muscle shortening and contraction on one side plus pressure on the cartilage on the same side. Furthermore, 1C states that when you have repetitive torsions in your spine, you will wear off the outer part of the disc and therefore increase the likelihood of um, discopathy and uh, hernia because the outer wall of the disc is weaker, hence the inside will have an easier time leaking out. That's for rule one. Hence, according to rule one, whenever you do something which is either prolonged or frequent or hazardous, hazardous means physical effort, your back should be neither hollow, nor round, nor twisted. What's in the middle is what I'm gonna do here. This is called flat, yeah? It doesn't mean your back is rigid and stiff as a plank, but it means that you control the curvature because you control the pelvis, okay? We're gonna come back to that later in the protocol. Posture rule number two states that you will never have issues because your neck would be too relaxed. A too relaxed neck is a concept that does not exist. What will strain the neck is what you do with your head. Your neck can be too flexed, that is more than 20 degrees, can be forward, that's what we're talking about, can be in extension, or can be rotated or tilted, which is also covered by rule number one. Okay, so these are five head factors that result in neck strain. Next to that, we have four elbow factors. Arms forward more than 20 degrees, arms sideways more than 20 degrees, elbows pulled back or upwards. So five head factors, four elbow factors. We need to minimize these nine factors to lower neck strain. And posture rule number three is the rule of the architect. The rule of the architect observes that your body starts on the ground and goes against gravity, exactly like a baobab or like a cathedral. And what makes these able to stand for centuries is the fact that they have strong foundations. Hence, the rule of the architect states that posture education or posture therapy always should start in the feet and move upwards one floor after the other. This is the reason why the protocol or the program or any posture program does not take only three exercises, but takes weeks or months. Yeah? We have to do a full reconstruction of your body. If you want to take an example of that, or a metaphor of that, imagine that you buy a countryside house and you observe that the roof is weak. Well, you can change the roof, of course, but two years later, you'll need to change it again if you haven't checked the stability of the walls or the foundations. So if you want to spare money slash spare energy, you start in the foundations and you build upwards. The protocol foresees that after explaining the basics of posture to the client or the patient, session one is also dedicated to how do we apply this when we sit. There's a long version to how to sit, which is linked in the description. That's the video on how to fine tune your sitting posture. And the short version is the one that I'm gonna give you now. The short version is, look, Mother gravity will always bring you in this direction. And this is your big enemy because it pushes your head forward. It will be aggravated by the fact that you have your feet forward. It will also be aggravated by the fact that you lean back because when you lean back, something needs to go to your keyboard and to your screen. And that means even more slumping, okay? So what we're trying to fight against is this backward rotation of your pelvis. To do so, we need to find something that will stabilize the pelvis. Hence, the short version of how to sit is, look, you need to get a push from the ground so that this push can throw you at the back of your chair where your pelvis, i.e. your belt, will meet the lower part of the chair 
which is called the lumbar support. And this lumbar support will help you prevent the pelvis backwards rotation and therefore the slouching. However, you should be careful that your shoulder blades are not against the backrest because if they are against the backrest, either you hollow your back, which is a violation of rule 1B, or you will slide forward, which is a violation of rule 1A, and which is going back into a forward head posture. So step one is to explain the sitting posture and to see how this sitting posture can be improved on the couch, on the office chair, on the kitchen chair, etc. You'll be particularly careful when people, or you, have this kind of semi-lying down position on their bed. This is a typical situation in which you push your head forward. As far as the office is concerned, you always adjust the office chair away from the desk. And then you go to the desk, and there, what you have to do is actually quite simple, is observe that you know, when your neck is relaxed, which is the application of rule number two, while your arms do little and your head and neck do little. So, there should be my keyboard and my mouse. That's minimum effort in my arm shoulder system. And here should be my screen, i.e. slightly below my line of sight. And you see the problem of a laptop. This isn't the size of the laptop. So whenever you use a laptop, you should always have a split keyboard and a split mouse. And if you work on software that take a lot of visual attention, such as Excel or video editing or things like this, well, it's much better to get also a split screen. In session one, we will therefore be particularly attentive to what you do with mobile devices. And we'll try to find techniques so that you use them much less. Every time you have a small screen, your head is projected forward and the smaller the screen, the more this phenomenon. One last thing we do in session one is emphasize that you need to check your eyes. If your visual acuity is not good, you will always put your head forward. After session one, the goal is on pelvic support. So you make sure that people or you always sit on their sitting bones against the lumbar support, whatever be the seat that they use, car, plane, couch, office, kitchen chair, no matter. The exercise for session one is the upper body reset, CF the description or the demo that I'm now gonna do. It can happen that people have so much pain that uh, it's difficult to have this as the first goal. But generally speaking, it's still okay. So let's do for the, go for the upper body reset. Make sure that your feet are pointing forward, that your knees are relaxed, and that your pelvis is pushed back. Step one is we relax the wrists, so flexion extension. Step two, you throw your thumbs. Step three, your elbows. Always very gently, never causing pain. Then we go with the shoulders, so you hit your buttocks. And then we'll add the neck, gently looking down, not too quick. And then we go with the whole spine, so you look far to the left, far to the right. I always look downwards to make sure that my back doesn't go hollow. And what I'm now gonna do is I'm now gonna flex my chin in between my collarbones and add a spinal flexion. But no point to go too low. You stop when your hands are at knee level. So the exercise prescription after session one is this upper body reset. Your aim is to reset your upper body at least 15 times a day. That means once per hour. Frequency matters much more than duration. So 50 times a day, upper body reset. And we see each other in two weeks for session two. In session two, 
both the goal and the exercise may seem a bit remote from the reason why you came to posture therapy because we'll be dealing with your feet and we'll be dealing with your spine as, as a whole not directly with your neck but remember rule number three rule number three was stating that we need to reconstruct the body as a whole starting in the feet and therefore we will need to work on your balance so let's go for the goal and then we switch to the exercise the first thing i always do is make people aware of the fact that their weight can be in direction of their toes which will make them do like an eagle you know the toes will cramp or their weight can be in direction of their heels in which case they will see their toes get off the ground what's neither one nor the other is when your weight feels like it's right under the arch of the foot there your toes are on the ground but they're relaxed next to that they can also be a sideway movement yeah you can have your weight more on the left foot or more on the right foot and what's neutral for avoiding a twisted back which you would have here yeah is when your weight is 50 50 between the two feet therefore what's neutral in terms of weight distribution is when your weight is under the arch of the two feet distributed 50 50 between left and right and the initial goal will be this will be well monitor what you do with your weight distribution during the day and whenever you feel like you're going on one leg or you feel like your weight is on your heels etc go back to under the arch 50 50 between the two feet and that will help us have strong foundations that will then be used to build the body upwards knee pelvis and spine it can happen when people have standing jobs that i add a secondary goal which is a bit of an exception to the salami technique with according to which i should have only one goal per session because if you tell people who were extending that they should always be with their weight under the arch disputed 50 50 it makes them extremely static and this will be difficult to keep for prolonged periods of time in this case i show them the military technique the military technique is a technique that is used to stand for prolonged periods of time whilst avoiding this sideway deviation what you'll do is put one foot slightly in front of its normal position say one to two inches and you'll let your whole body move back and forth and here two things will happen number one as you create this back forth movement while well, you're unable to shift sideways and twist your back number two you're reactivating the muscle contraction relaxation especially if in addition you play with your knees and therefore this will say bring the blood back to the heart avoid accumulation of metabolic waste in the legs and therefore reduce leg tiredness so when you're static assess how your weight distribution is and if you need to stand for very long instead of shifting your weight to one leg well just use the military technique create back and forth movement and therefore you will avoid twisting your back then comes the exercise the exercise is actually the cousin of the upper body reset that we saw in session one why the cousin because there are two exercises that should belong to everybody's daily hygiene number one is the upper body reset number two is the modified cat cow happy dog exercise that we're going to do now and which helps mobilize the spine in every region and every direction therefore preserve spinal mobility and as the neck is part of and built on your spine the fact that your spine is both flexible and under control without blockages will avoid that the neck pays the price for things that go wrong underneath so here is how cat cow happy dog works it seems at first like a known exercise but i will show you six variants that ensure 
that you have really fully mobilized your spine or almost fully actually and you will see that you actually don't know the exercise that well so you start on fours and I like to train on my fists because it avoids wrist extension which is a source of increased pressure in the carpal tunnel um, and for people with thoracic outlet syndrome this may be quite critical if the fist directly on the ground is painful while well, you put a yoga mat, a towel or anything you start version one with your elbows and your fists right under your shoulders and your knees right under your hips and the first part of the exercise is hollow back but be careful that you start the movement in the pelvis and that your neck follows then you go back to a flat back and then you move to a round back in which you're looking at what's happening behind you and then you shift to flat back if you want to be perfectionist, whenever you go from flat to hollow or round to flat, you should inhale and whenever you round your back, you should exhale because this folds your lungs and pushes the air out. So version one is this say, standard known version of the cat cow, but that you do precisely. Version two, we're going to move with the knees more open than 90 degrees and this will help mobilize the lower back always train slowly version three we go with the knees bent around 45 degrees and this helps mobilize the upper back including the upper ribs and in thoracic outlet syndrome this is very critical because the first and the second ribs are often kind of out of place or say uh, blocked at least each one of these movements you will do three to five times this is for cat cow then we move to happy dog which is the sideway rotation happy dog is always with a flat back and it's about bringing the right hip to the right shoulder and then the left hip to the left shoulder and what you observe it does, this is a pure pelvic movement. There's no lateral unbalance of my weight. The weight distribution remains absolutely constant under the fists and the knees. So this was version four, in which I was at 90 degrees in the shoulders and in the hip joints. And obviously you got the same. You got the lower, happy dog for the lower back, which is like this, in which you should make sure that your back doesn't go hollow and then you get the happy dog for the upper back and upper ribs which is like this in which the uh, movement amplitude is very small but that's normal so for session two your exercise is to at least three times a day practice this happy dog cat cow uh, six variants insisting where you feel that it's the most helpful to you the exercise is almost complete because you see that there's one movement that we haven't done which is a torsion of your back yeah that will come a bit later i mean i show an exercise for this to some patients not to all it depends a bit on the context but we will see that in the very last session when the discussion will be on okay now how do we say implement this on the long term how do we change your daily posture hygiene Around two weeks after session two comes session three. I should get a Nobel Prize for that. And as in session two, we have dealt with static balance, i.e. how do you preserve your balance on the spot? Well, in session three, we're gonna th make things a bit more complex and discuss how to preserve your balance when there's movement. But the movement that we will create is very specific movement, is movement that happens either in your knees or in your pelvis so we will of course make sure that you have achieved what you had to achieve after session two i.e that you master this idea, this idea that your weight should be under the arch of the feet and then i will ask you to preserve this balance under the arch 50 50 
absolutely unchanged whilst you bend your knees. So this is a very slow exercise with your eyes open or even closed, which is even more ideal. And it is a millimetric exercise, i.e. precision is your only goal. You only aim at keeping your balance absolutely perfect. It's not a matter of reps, it's not a matter of all that. This is the first movement. The second movement becomes extremely relevant in terms of forward head posture because you, we discussed in the introduction that when your pelvis is forward, your head goes forward. So what we're now going to do is make sure that people can preserve or that you can preserve your weight balanced whereas you shift your pelvis back and forth. Yeah. So this is a wrong posture, but at least I'm balanced under my feet. And this is what we will discover as being a better posture and I'm still balanced. So you see that something had to, to, to compensate. As my pelvis was forward here, my upper body was backwards. And as my pelvis is shifting backwards, my upper body is more forward. This is particularly interesting in terms of neck strain. When I'm here, my arms are actually behind me. In other words, I will have to do a lot of effort in my neck to reach my keyboard or to reach anything that I do forward, e.g. when I peel potatoes, for example, or when I cook, okay? So this posture is a direct source of neck strain. Violation of rule number two. And of course, violation of rule number one because my back is hollow. Now, observe what happens if my pelvis is shifted backwards. Well, here my arms can cross freely in front of my hip joints and therefore typing or peeling potatoes does not require any effort in my neck anymore. Hence, in this session, I already introduced the idea that the best posture for your pelvis is slightly backwards, exactly like monkeys, exactly like children, and that if we want this to happen properly, well, the weight balance should be super well under control, because if you do this and go on your heels, you'll never be able to sustain such posture. What we have just done falls as a goal. How do we make it a goal? Well, we make it a goal by explaining to people that they should monitor what they do with their feet in daily activities, e.g. for example when they cook and whenever they catch themselves not on their two feet under the arch well number one they go back under the arch under their feet and number two when they do what I call the penguin test this is the penguin test and observe that they hit their thighs well they use this movement to bring their pelvis backwards again without altering the weight balance exercise now now we're really targeting the vicious cycle that I mentioned in the introduction. One of the components of this vicious cycle, I would say the first one by order of gravity, i.e. from bottom to top, is the fact that your mid-back goes round. So what we will do is introduce in your day an exercise that aims at reinforcing the mid-back extensor muscles. There are two variants to this exercise. One is the variant on force, which I call the prayer exercise. And the other one is on a chair, which is quite handy because you can practice it at work. Here comes the prayer on force. What's cool with this prayer on force is that you can say, add it to the exercise that we were doing last session which was your daily hygiene exercise of the cat cow and the happy dog. So after you did the happy dog, then you go on your forearms, make sure that your lower back is flat, make sure that your chin is brought backwards, push your mid back slightly downwards, and then you kind of exert a pressure of your elbows on the ground in direction of your knees. And that should create tension in your mid back which is a sign that you're strengthening the mid-back extensors. The sitting down version is exactly the same. You sit with your heels under your knees 
and you bring your forearms on the inner side of your knees. And then you make sure that your lower back is flat, that your neck is brought back, and you move your mid back slightly forward. That means a centimeter or two max, you know, it's a micro movement. And then I press my forearms on the inner side of my knees in direction of my belly, making sure that my fingers are super relaxed. And you see that my back is flat as a plank and that I feel tension in the mid back muscles. Well, that's exactly what I wanted. And therefore, this will be the new exercise. This new exercise should be also practiced at least three times a day for 40 to 60 seconds at a time. Ideally, I recommend this exercise in the morning and in the early afternoon so that you kind of wake up the, the muscles in your mid back and therefore they will be ready for use for the half day to come. It's not harmful to do the exercise in the evening, but waking up these muscles, which help, um, say, support an erect posture just before you go lying down is less useful. Yeah? So no harm, but less usefulness if you do it just before going to bed. Hence do it before you're gonna sit for a while. Let's go for session four, which happens two to three weeks after the previous one. Now we're going to touch at a very, very critical issue, which is pelvic rotation, pelvic tilt. And this is something that may have struck you in the previous session, which is when I told you to push the pelvis back whilst keeping your weight balance, you could have said, but wait, Olivier, when I do that, it can happen that my back is super hollow. Correct, this was wrong. And this would have been correct. But the thing is, I didn't want to make things too complex. So I always tell my patients, yeah, look, for now it could be when you push your pelvis back that it happens to be a bit hollow, but we're gonna take it easy and fix this in two weeks. So just be a bit patient and we'll get there. So now is the time to learn how to tilt the pelvis so as to flatten the lower back once the pelvis is in place. It's super important that we do things in this order because in many yoga classes or Pilates classes you will learn pelvic tilt but without discussing about this backward forward position of the pelvis and as a result many people tell me yeah I learned in the yoga how to do pelvic tilt look now I stand well really do you? You know? So pelvic tilt will be dramatic if the pelvis has not been put at the right place before. And that was the goal of session three. The thing is, when people are there, if you teach them how to turn their pelvis right away standing, many of them will push the pelvis forward when they tilt it. Hence, we need to go step by step, first kneeling, then using a chair, then using the wall and then freestanding. Kneeling is the first step because when you kneel, the pelvis can't move backward forward. So after last week where we learned pelvic tilt on fours, well, with kneeling, we slowly move to a more upright position. So what you will do is make sure that your torso is very much forward and you're gonna do a hollow back and then a flat back. You may even be able to do a round back, i.e. you sit on your heels. And flat, and hollow, and flat. And once you master this, we can switch to the next step, which is using a chair. The chair is just here for helping you keep this distance between the pelvis and the backrest. And the idea is the same once more, we go hollow, flat, and maybe you can go round and flat. Yeah? When you go hollow, you should feel strain in your lower back muscles because they are in charge of hollowing your back together with the iliopsoas muscle. And when you go flat, yeah, there you will feel your lower abs 
and your glutes. When you do this, as you now stand, it is essential that you integrate the teaching of the previous sessions, in particular the fact that your weight is under the arch 50-50. It's very important that you don't shift your weight backwards in direction of your heels. After the chair, we use a wall or a shelf or something, and the idea is again the same. You lean with your forehead on the wall, go hollow and flat, and make sure that the pelvis doesn't go any further or any closer to the shelf when you do the hollow back and the flat back. This distance should remain always the same. And once you know how to do this, well, you can use one or two fingers on the wall, yeah, and go hollow, flat. It also helps to keep your thumbs right here uh, on the hip crest to make sure that the pelvis doesn't shift back and forth. This four step process takes a bit of time. So usually I let people train for say two to three weeks, preferably three weeks, so that they really have the time to integrate this. And how does the goal definition look like? Well, it looks like, look, interrupt yourself in all kinds of standing activities. And whenever you do the penguin test and find yourself uh, with your pelvis too far forward, instead of just pushing it back, you will now push it back and tilt it inwards. And yes, you may feel some discomfort in your abs because they're usually not used to work that much, but they will get used to it. In other words, they will get reconditioned. In terms of exercises, we will really keep focusing on the pathology. And in thoracic outlet syndrome, the strain in the scalene muscles pulls on both their attachments, i.e. your cervicals are usually blocked and your first and second ribs are tilted upwards as previously, previously mentioned. Therefore, the exercise for this session will be about mobilizing the upper ribs. Mobilizing means make them move so as to restore their mobility. This is an exercise that I've never showed on, on YouTube. It's based on Carol Hewitt's excellent book, which is Manipulative Therapy in the Rehabilitation of the Locomotor System. This book is kind of a Bible of manual therapy. The only thing is it's super difficult to find. It took me three years or so. So let's go. What we're gonna do is if we wanna mobilize the upper ribs on the right side, we're gonna bend forward with the right arm in between your legs, meaning that the left arm is um, outside. And we're gonna turn the head to the left, which creates a pull here in the scalene triangle. And the only thing with this exercise is whilst looking upwards, you will inhale deeply and exhale. Inhale. And exhale and you do this a few times the exercise is adjusted or fine-tuned by finding the right flexion angle so you really need to explore this space to see what's the the back position that helps you most in respect with feeling what happens in the scalene triangle this exercise can be practiced say two times a day. So you still, at this stage of the treatment, do the upper reset 10 to 15 times a day. Do the happy dog, cat, cow thingy at least three times a day. Reinforce your back muscles. And now you add this. And probably you start worrying because the exercise list is growing, but you still need to be patient until session eight in which we're gonna discuss the three box system to clarify this. So for now, you're in intensive care. You just exercise and don't count the time. Later, I will deal with this issue. Now comes session five. If you remember session three, we were doing the mid-back strengthening 
and the goal of it was to avoid this, say, slumping in the upper half of your back, which would project your shoulders forward and as a result, push your head forward. Now we're going to deal with the second component of the vicious cycle, which is precisely um, the round shoulder posture, which is another cause of forward head posture or slumping in the upper back. And to do that, dealing with shoulders uh, forward, we will both strengthen the back muscles here, especially the lower trapezius and the latissimus dorsi, that's the goal, and the exercise will be about stretching your pecs. So your daily goal is to be able to stabilize your collarbones, i.e. your shoulder blades, when doing th something with your arms forward. So you see, instead of letting my shoulder blades glide sideways and my collarbones shift forward when I do something with my arms forward, I should be able to bring them back. Yeah? And this is the job of the lower trapezius in particular. There are different ways to mobilize the, uh, the, the lower trapezius and latissimus dorsi, which together form an M in your back, so I always name it the M. So there are different ways to strengthen your M. And we'll review these different ways of mobilizing the M so that you can choose the one that you prefer. Possibility number one is to move the AC joint here. Yeah? So you will push your AC joint forward. Whilst keeping it forward, you'll move it upwards. Whilst keeping it upwards, you're going to bring it as far back as you can. And now you should really hate me. Yeah? Make sure that your pelvis is back and in. And now you lower your shoulder blades, release a bit the tension in between the two shoulder blades and go further a bit. And you should feel tension here, yeah, which is the M. So that's possibility number one. Possibility number two is kind of a shortcut to do the same, is you slump in your upper back a bit like a depressed guy or girl. And you're gonna bring your collarbones straight into your mid-back where you would attach your bra brand. So it looks like this. It looks like clack, collar bones go into my mid-back. Again, make sure that your back doesn't go hollow. You should stabilize the pelvis and you see why we're doing things in this sequence. Possibility number three. Hold your arms like you would be holding, say, kind of the steering of a motorbike and imagine that you have a big inflatable ball in between your elbows. And what you're going to do is press your elbows inwards so as to create some strain under the armpit. Okay? And of course in the mid-back. So that is the movement because there's no movement. Fourth and final possibility, you bring your arms at 90 degrees from your body with the palms facing upwards. Your goal is to stick your elbows to your side and to open your arms like this whilst keeping your elbows as close as you can to your torso. You should already start feeling something in your mid-back and now you will reopen your elbows and there the tension starts to really, really increase. Make sure that your pelvis is back and in. And when you feel this tension, well, you keep the tension whilst relaxing your arms, okay? Again, this only works if your pelvis is back and in. So what's your daily goal? Your daily goal is whenever you perceive that your collarbones are forward, you use one of these four methods to bring them back in place, i.e. to let your shoulder blades slide downwards and together and thereby you also contribute to strengthening the lower trapezius which will help it really keep your shoulder blades together and by the way you see here why posture correctors don't work is that most of them will bring your shoulder blades horizontally together and not diagonally downwards and as they bring them together they contract the rhomboids and 
the upper trapezius create neck strain, whereas when you mobilize the M, you see that there's no neck strain. There's strength here, i.e. in the foundations of the neck. And this mobilization of the next foundation is what helps the neck stay relaxed because it's on solid ground. Now let's switch to the exercise. The exercise is the complementary part of what we've just done. It's about opening here. So one was about strengthening here. The other one is about removing the resistance. The resistance that can, for example, be fed by the fact that your keyboard is too far forward instead of being here as we have discussed in session one. To stretch the pecs, we have different possibilities, but you know, I'd like to show you the lying down on the floor exercises because the cool thing about them is that you don't need any bed, you don't need any couch, okay? Plus, we will adapt, this is say the 2.0 version of the protocol, the exercise, so as to also stretch the serratus anterior, which is often responsible for armpit pain and side pain that lasts for very long, that doesn't want to be removed and which is often kind of coming together with this thoracic outlet syndrome. So let's just lie down on the ground, you use a yoga mat if you feel like it and we see what we can do without any accessory. I'm going to use a pillow just for comfort and what I'm going to do is lie on the side or semi side so as to be able to let my arm hang outside of my body. So see, when I lie down here at a sufficient distance from the wall, stretching the pecs is simple. It's just about letting my arm hang down at 90 degrees from my body. That's one branch of the pectoralis and make sure that the collarbone is not forward, but is pulled back. Second part of the exercise is when the arm is down. And third part of the exercise is when it's up. Each one of these three stretching positions should be held for 40 to 60 seconds without causing any pain. If you feel anything which does not feel right, correct your posture until you feel no pain. The idea is that if you feel pain, you will automatically generate contraction and contraction is the very opposite of what we're trying to reach. What we'll also do is add a version in which my fist is on my sacrum and that will help stretching this serratus anterior that I mentioned earlier. So you see, the exercise looks exactly the same, except that now my fist is on my very, very lower spine and I let my elbow hang downwards. So this is your daily exercise for this session and you should practice, say, twice a day, morning, and evening. If you have the time to do one more and three times in total, well, great. For session six, the goal is to learn how to mobilize the cervical spine throughout the day, and that is to prevent neck blockages. The exercise will be a bit um, strange maybe for you, which is stretching the piriformis. And you may ask, hey, what's the link between thoracic outlet syndrome and piriformis? Well, no, there's no direct link. It's more an opportunity thing, in the sense that I see many office workers with thoracic outlet syndrome, and the other pathology that uh, office workers do have often due to prolonged sitting and due to sitting for too long in too bad postures, is contraction of the piriformis leading to sciatic pain. And therefore, as I see them now for neck issues, and I may not see them later, well, this is a golden opportunity to teach them how to avoid this sciatic pain. But let's start with the goal. The goal is around three exercises, and then we will see how we can integrate them in daily life. The three exercises can, of course, be done standing, but sitting is safer. There's less mobility when you sit, i.e. more posture safety. The first exercise is a generic neck mobilization exercise. We're going to mobilize all the cervical spine. So we start with the nose that will always remain vertical. That means the ear is not tilting 
in direction of the shoulder. And with the nose vertical, we rotate the head to the right, say for example, and then we're going to draw a semicircle to the other shoulder. Once we're there, we go horizontally to the other side. And again, not too quick. And at some point, you U-turn and you go the other way around. The reason why we do only a semicircle is that if we would go the other way around, we would have a combination of hollow neck and twisted neck, which is a violation, a massive violation of rule one and rule two. So we don't do that. Second exercise aims at the lower cervical spine. The lower cervical spine is typically strained when you're on your mobile phone or on your laptop because your head is too flexed. This is another exercise by Carol Hewitt as we saw when we were mobilizing the upper ribs. So we will move the arms at 45 degrees to the side and one hand will have its palm facing in direction of the ceiling. And what we're going to do is nose vertical, always look at the palm facing the ground. The fingers are spread outwards and as we turn our head, we turn the arms so that we always look at the hand that is facing the ground. And you do three, four, five ways and backs. Third exercise is this time about mobilizing the upper cervical spine which is where the scalene muscles attach. And actually this exercise is also used for the scalene cramp test, i.e. to see if the scalene are blocked. When do you mess up your upper cervical spine? Well, typically when you slump and look horizontally forward. You see, your upper neck is now under tension. The exercise goes like this. Nose vertical, turn your head to one side, and when you exhale, you bring your chin down. And same to the other side. So these are three neck mobilization exercises and at this stage you may be completely confused and wondering how can this be a goal? Well, simply because these exercises are extremely compatible with a number of daily situations in which you sit but you actually don't do much. I mean, when you're at the traffic light, when you watch TV, even when you sit on the toilets or when you have a Zoom meeting. So you see, the idea is, okay, we're going to mobilize the neck extremely frequently and this will avoid that the strain goes exponentially high. Okay, and we will connect this to the daily activities, therefore it is a daily goal. So now the key is your ability to identify these dead micro moments which are actually available for your neck even if your brains are busy. Let's now switch to the exercise which, as I said earlier, is the stretch of the piriformis. There are two reasons for a sciatic pain. Number one is a compression of the sciatic nerve in the lower spine because of a disc hernia and reason number two which is in my opinion but I have no exact statistics on this quite uh, more common is strain in the piriformis so you need to learn how to stretch the piriformis and this is a typical evening stretch you know when you're lying down in bed before you fall asleep do this you're going to bring one foot in direction of your buttocks and then the other one and then if I stretch the left piriformis, the idea is that my left lower leg is both horizontal and as perpendicular as it can be to my body. Therefore, I will grab the foot with my arm or with the belt if my arm is too short and create the stretch by pressing either with the other knee or with my fist. Yeah, And I'm bringing the left knee in direction of the opposite shoulder. This is an exercise that I even do every day, especially on days where I've been sitting a lot, either at the office or because I drove a lot. 
Let's now switch to session number seven, which is, say, the last session in which we officially learn something. Session number eight will be more about organizing the future. So in session seven, we are going to stretch the neck. At last, will you think, why did we not do this earlier? Because these stretches are extremely precise. That's reason number one. So you need good body awareness and good body control to do them. And reason number two is, well, I don't want to stretch things that are super tense, muscles that are super tense. So first we had relaxation, which you still have. And then we worked on the M to reduce the strain on the neck and the upper trapezius in particular. And then we learned how to mobilize the neck, the goal being to remove the blockages. So now everything is in place to stretch safely. This time we're not going to use a pillow because we need the head to hang in direction of the ground. I'm going to lie down. Of course, you will find sitting and standing version of these stretches, but one, they are much less safe because it's more difficult to be precise when you sit or stand than when you lie down. And number two, when you sit or stand, the weight of your head is on the muscles that you're trying to stretch, i.e. acts as a resistance to the stretch. When I lie down, there's no weight of my head on the tissues and in the contrary, the weight of my head will assist the stretch. So, you know, this version is much more effective than the other ones, as you can read from the comments of the videos that are related to these muscles, which I link in the description. So let's go. I'm going to lie down on the side. What's important is two things. Number one is you don't lie on your shoulder blade, but rather in direction of your chest. Number two, you don't collapse with your shoulders one in direction of the other. This would be round shoulder posture, but you use your M to keep your whole width erect, if I may say. Okay? You grab your foot or your ankle so that you can stabilize the shoulder blade down on the direction, on the side, that you're trying to stretch. And we have two stretches for upper trapezius and levator scapulae. Stretch number one is here in direction of the shoulder, like this. Yeah? To maximize the effectiveness of the stretch, I will combine with something that's called post-isometric relaxation. When inhaling, I will go against gravity, i.e. upwards, and when exhaling, I let go. And again. And you see, the more I do that, the further the stretch goes. Okay? So you usually need to do this like three times, and that will be enough. So this is stretching position number one, which you have to do on two sides. Hold the stretch for 40 to 60 seconds. Stretching position number two now. Still the same basic position in direction of your chest, keep your width, bring your shoulder blade low, turn your head and bring your chin on your collarbone. And the stretch is more central, more in direction of your spine. And of course, you can also combine with post isometric relaxation. And again, you observe the same, the more I do, the further I go. And the rule is always the same. You don't want to create pain. So these are stretches for the posterior neck muscles. Now we at last going to stretch the scalene muscles, which are the problem that we have been trying to tackle since the beginning. So let's go. We lie down on the back, bring one foot back, the other one. Make sure that your back is flat on the ground that your palms are facing upwards and use your M to stick your collarbones to the ground. And then I'll put the left ear in direction of the left shoulder, turn my head to the right and have a slight extension. And now I'm actually stretching the right side. On the other side, right ear to the right shoulder, turn to the left, slight extension. Now we're at session eight. Session eight is the last session, at least in the standard protocol, and it is not foreseen that you learn anything new here, 
unless we have discovered on the way that you have something else that needs to be fixed, such as forearm pain or something. Yeah? The goal of session 8 will be to develop a system that allows you to say keep training and keep changing your behavior so that the new behavior becomes a habit. For this, I use a three box system. Box number one is about exercises that you need to do all the time, every day, several times a day. This includes upper body reset and the cat cow uh, happy dog thingy. One more exercise is up to you, depending on what you have noticed to be your weak spot. Max three exercises is, I think, realistic for Mr. and Mrs. Everybody to do every day. Box number two is about exercises that are, say, to be done a few times per week, and these are for maintenance. Typically, that could be the upper ribs mobilization or the cervical mobilization. Box number three is about escalation, is when you feel that things go off track, what do you do? Calling your physio or your osteopath can be a very good alternative, but it may take two, three weeks until they can see you. Therefore, there are things that you need to do in between. And during the course of the treatment, well, we may have had to have this discussion in the sense that, okay, do we prefer heat or cold and where? How do we do um, trigger point massage? Uh, how do we use a TENS or EMS unit, etc. Et so box number three is about escalation. And well, this one will depend on you, on your conditions, on your means. I hope that you find this video useful. It took me really a really long time to shoot and to edit. There are things that I needed to shoot again because I messed up the first time. So I hope you appreciate the effort. And if so, well, be aware that you can find even more in my book, The Posture Manual. If you need personal assistance or personal advice, the best is that you check out the page of the online posture programs which are the app-based programs that I have developed for people like you who work in an office, who don't have a great posture and who have back pain, neck pain, shoulder pain. Both programs will give you access to the Posture Academy, which is the private Facebook group on which I give weekly exercise sessions. And the long program will also give you the opportunity to have three one-on-one -on -one session. So have a look at that if you want to discuss about it while well, you fill in the, the contact form and uh, we will set up a Zoom call together. If you're a physiotherapist or another paramedical colleague, well, I hope that this video could give you some insight into how I treat people with forward head posture and the consequences thereof. I'm very happy to have interdisciplinary exchange on your best practice, how you do things, how you could make this protocol evolve and grow. So please feel free to contact me as well.